Good morning, church. It is good to be with you wherever you are. That's the thing about our safe harbor. We are with you wherever you are. And it's nice to have videos from Greece and the far off exotic land of southern Indiana, uh, as well as, as here. Uh, it is, it's just a treat. It really is. And to watch you check in, if you've not checked in and are on a device that's able to do that, it's just so encouraging. Um, we've gotten check-ins from Mexico and all over the U.S. already. Uh, we usually get a check-in from Tanzania too, so we'll be looking for that one. There are times, Paul says, that we need meat. He says we, we need to grow up. He talked to one of the churches saying, I've been giving you milk, but by this time you should be able to handle meat. And these sermons, and this is, this is part six of a series, so if you've come in late, make sure you go back and, and catch up, because this is meat, and it's going to get meatier, and we're going to do a little bit more meat this morning. We introduced a new term to many of you last week, although it's a term that's used frequently by biblical scholars, and that is multivocality. That means, for our purposes, that the Bible is not univocal. It does not speak with one voice. Rather, you will find points of view, arguments, and differences between writers and within single books themselves. To me, this is beautiful. This is fascinating. But I understand how disorienting it can be for those that have really equated Bible with God and the perfection of God they expect to find in Scripture when God didn't tell us that he told us something else. And we've even looked at some of that tension between a few verses in 1 Corinthians and Timothy, 1 Timothy, and the rest of Scripture when it comes to the role of women in God's church, his kingdom. We've even looked at the different voices of Deuteronomy and Job and how they make different promises. But the easiest space to find multivocality in Scripture is in the Psalms. In fact, I used to not like the Psalms. I thought they were schizophrenic. When I was a young boy, people would talk about how they found comfort in the Psalms. So I read the Psalms. I found no comfort there. I found praise, and I found arguments, and I found complaints, and then I found praise. And to me, it was like, pick a lane. What, what are we supposed to be doing here? It bothered me. Now, I've learned a lot about the Psalms, but to be honest, there is so much more I need to learn. We're going to look at one thing uh, at the Psalms, but also a real problem in Christianity, and that is theodicy. Now, we already know that word if you've been following us through the years. Theodicy is the study of why there is suffering and pain in the universe when there's also an all-powerful and purely righteous God. It's a study of the justice of God, the fairness of God, the righteousness of God with the existence of evil. How do we reconcile these things? Now, I believe in God, and that's why this is a problem. If you do not believe in God, evil in the universe is not a problem. You expect it. If you are purely, let's say, Darwinian, uh, for lack of a better term, and you feel like, you know, survival of the fittest, although people misuse that phrase quite a bit, and therefore nature is, is uh, as a poet said, nature is red in tooth and claw, then evil in the world makes all the sense in the world. But if you believe in a pure and a righteous God, then, who is also all powerful, then you've got a problem that you need to work with. So, how do we handle that? Imagine a problem as a triangle. On this one side, you've got the belief that God is just. On another side, you have the belief that he is all-powerful. On the third side, you have your observation, and that is that there are wars, and there are famines, and there are hurricanes, and there are tornadoes, and there are diseases, and there are accidents of birth, whether that's a genetic accident, or someone was born in, let's say, South Sudan, rather than in Chicago, rather than in London. They were not given the, the opportunities. They will never have the opportunities to have food, shelter, and safety that some others do. How do we explain this? A traditional Christian response to this is to avoid it. By the way, this argument against an all-powerful righteous God 
predates Christianity. Hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, Greek philosophers were already using this argument. So this is not something atheists came up with recently in any stretch. It's a real problem. So a traditional response is from Christians is to lop off one of the corners. Because you can't have all three with traditional responses of Christians. They'll say that God is all-powerful, but he really isn't because he's given up some of that power to give us free will. But that doesn't really solve the problem of disease or accident because disease or accident by and large are not free will. You know, if I, if people have asked how Cammie and I, we, we just got back from a trip. How was the trip? It was fine. There were zero accidents, illnesses or the like. But if one of us had gotten a cold or if somebody had knocked into our car, we all would understand that wasn't our choice. That wasn't our fault. We, that was not a lifestyle issue. It's not as if we had diabetes and we were just you know, slamming down Snickers bars, which for those of you outside the country are Mars bars in British territories, similar. Uh, and for the rest of you, it's just a wonderful gift from the heavens, um, full of chocolate nut and nougat. And nobody knows what nougat is and it's not important. <laughs> but we did not cause an illness. And many of people didn't cause their illness or the like. So that doesn't answer the question. Do you get that? God laying aside some of his power so that we have free will didn't, didn't answer that equation entirely. So some Christians will go further and they'll just say, well, it's not God's fault. It's Adam and Eve's fault. They sinned, therefore everything's awful. And it's not his fault. But again, if he's all righteous and all powerful, why does he allow injustice to occur? Now, that some of you are going to get uncomfortable talking like this. Read the Psalms. That's what they talk about. And in fact, we're going to take a look at it, a little bit of that, but not yet, because it gets worse. The majority of the Christians make this argument that we just said because it's been handed to them by their spiritual leaders who have worked on this very hard for a very long time. However, there are also those that posit that God is not just. Where would they get such an idea? From the Bible. Exodus 32 says God repented of the evil he intended against them. In other words, God intended evil, but that he decided not to do it in that instance. Now, if that bothers you, I get it, because it really bothered the NIV translators. Because in Isaiah 45, verse 7, all the notes are in the description for the video on YouTube. See, they're free. We don't charge for these things. Because other people give, we are able to do this. Um, And so if you can give, that helps. Anyway, back to this. Isaiah 45, verse 7 The scripture says, God creates both peace and evil. That's what the text says. The New American Standard Bible, which tries to get it exactly correct, uh, comes very close, causing well-being and creating disaster. The NIV saw this and they blinked and they decided to punt it. And so they, they put it instead, he creates light and darkness. Not even close. Not even close to the Hebrew there. Others try to lop off the corner. And by the way, I'm not solving your problem, am I? I didn't solve problem one, didn't solve problem two. We're going to problem three now, not going to solve it either. They try to lop off that one. And I've heard sermons on this. I've read books on it. And that is, we don't deny that people are suffering. But it only looks unjust. But there might be a good reason for their suffering. Perhaps, they say, it's all part of God's perfect plan and perfect justice. I understand the argument. In some, at some level, C.S. Lewis makes this argument, and he's one of my heroes, so I'm not dissing anybody on either side of this triangle. But it doesn't give any comfort and often piles guilt onto the sufferer or to those who love them. But it's taught from many pulpits. I mean, how many times have you suffered and heard someone attempt to comfort you by saying God has a plan? I, don't, I cannot count the number of times I've been ill or been in an accident, lost a job once, you know, whatever it was, and people didn't circle around saying, God has a plan. I'm sure he has a plan. 
But if you're saying that part of his plan is that my child has cancer or that makes us wrestle with who God is, does it not? There are only two questions that are of any importance in the world. One, what kind of God created the world? And two, what kind of world did that God create? And the Psalms wrestles with them. Like I said, you're not going to find a solution. You're going to find that it doesn't try to solve pain and injustice. It argues about it. It reveals it. It complains about it. Like in Psalm 13, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say, I've overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. By the way, if this makes you uncomfortable at all, please remember when we talked about Deuteronomy and Job, that Job went to God and argued with him and said, I demand my time in court. You tell me why you're doing this. And at the end of the book of Job, God says, Job is the one who spoke right. And he spoke about me correct. That's, um, that's a pretty powerful lesson. I'm not really sure I've learned it yet. But there's more. Some call these, by the way, psalms of lament. But I prefer the term that Walter Brueggemann used, a great, great scholar. He calls them psalms of disorientation. There are many psalms of orientation. Those are the ones we like. The Lord is my shepherd. I will have need of nothing. You know, we love those. We love that God sits enthroned over the flood in Psalm 29, verse 10. These are psalms of orientation. We love those because God's on his throne and all is right in the world. You've heard that phrase? Poets like it. The English poets used it quite a bit. And although they were English, they were pretty good poets. But psalms of orientation is not all that's in the book of Psalms. In fact, more than a third of the Psalms are Psalms of disorientation, where things are not going well. When I was a boy, we, we got, when we'd get a new hymn book, we would have a special time after Sunday night service. You couldn't, couldn't preclude any of the services, where they would hand out the books and then markers, and we had to X out the songs we weren't allowed to sing. Because they weren't acceptable. And some we could change, but sing, but we had to change some words. That'll sound really odd to some of you. And some of you, it'll bring back flashbacks. A little PTSD. One of the songs we could not sing was uh, the song, Master the Temptest is Raging. I love that song. The great build up in a, uh, the wind and the wave shall obey thy will. Peace. But part of the song says, carest thou not that we perish. How canst thou lie asleep? And we were told we weren't allowed to sing that because, quote, you cannot sing your doubts to God. And then I read Psalms, which are songs. And more than one third are doubts. And Jesus quoted them. And it was his hymn book growing up. It's what most of them used to know God because most of them didn't there's no way they could memorize the, the Torah, the, the Pentateuch, but the Psalms, you read Psalm 119, set aside some time. It's a long, it's the longest chapter in the Bible. And once he keeps talking about this over and over again, the law, the law, the law, he's not really talking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He's talking about learning the law of God and how God deals with us. It's, it's a Psalm. This dance with God that we all do. We want to stay there, but we want to stay in a good place. But how about Psalm 88? I went through a very difficult time. Not important to explain the whys and wherefores of it, because your times are not my times. But we all understand the difficult times, do we not? And Psalm 88 became my song. And there is no resolution at the end of Psalm 88. Psalm 13 has a little resolution, a little bit at the end. Psalm 88 does not come back saying, but I trust you and it's going to be okay. It doesn't. And I went through Psalm 88 again and again and again. It's not a long psalm, 
you might want to read it and see if it's what the words of your heart have always wanted to say to God, but you're afraid you couldn't. Yeah, you can. It's in the Bible. Psalm 88, I'll just dip in a couple places, seven to nine. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You've overwhelmed me with all your waves. You've taken me from my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined. I cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. And then the last three, four verses. From my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. That's the last line. There's no happy ending here. But in others, the Psalms of Orientation, the ones we really like, there are happy endings or hopeful endings at least. We come across these, this is my point, and we want there to be one single answer. One answer that takes care of this. One line of that triangle and that we can beef that one up and now we're good. But there is no single answer offered in Psalms or the rest of Scripture. Our Bible speaks with many voices because we are humans and our experiences are vastly different from each other and from day to day from ourselves. So, Knowing this, let's go back to that little question we've got. You might have heard of it. What can women do in the kingdom of God? Reading recently, I I reread, I read every new edition that comes out of handbooks of denomination in the United States. Not a lot of people take reference books with them on vacation, but some people don't know how to have fun, and I don't know that I can help them. But in, in many of the, of the ones were started, many of the churches were started because people weren't hard enough on keeping the women quiet. I'm going, hmm, what do, we, what do we do with the question of whether or not women are limited or even forbidden in serving certain roles because of their sex? Let's go back to a river of stories that we call the Bible because that's what it is. It's a river, it's a blend My wife and I were talking on the way home last night about the book of Nehemiah. I know, it's an exciting life. Not everybody has it. I don't mean to make you jealous. But as we're we're driving, I said, we never, we get this idea. Nehemiah sat down and wrote Nehemiah. But the problem is, Nehemiah goes first person, then it switches to third person. Then it goes back to first person, then it switches to third person, ends with a little bit of first person. Which means somebody else took his memoir, edited it, and added bits in between. It wasn't just dictated. And I said, and it's right there in front of us if we just look at the pronouns. And yet, people are terrified of this. It's a river of stories. It's our river. We love it. But we've come down the river and we've hit two rocks. From 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2. Go back to the last week's sermon. If you haven't, if you're trying to cheat, coming in at the end of class and taking the test, you're going to fail. We, last week, we explained the metaphor of the river, rocks, and eddies, and stagnant pools. As we detailed then, women often led in life, in worship. Deborah leading the hymn after they were saved from the Red Sea. We have Hulda. We have the, um, the prophetesses that are in Scripture. We have the, the you know, Deborah, who is leader, secular, and religious. We can go on and on. And then we come to the New Testament. It doesn't come to an end. No. Women helped Jesus in his ministry, provided places for him to gather his disciples, funded his work, and received most of his compliments and most of his public regard. We don't see anything changing when we get to Acts 2 And the kingdom is established. The church is launched on Pentecost. Just like scripture said that Jesus would come. The spirit would come with power and fall upon them. And it does. And on day of Pentecost, the apostles are up preaching. We get Peter's sermon. But the Bible says all of them were preaching. 
And that makes a lot of sense because there would have been multiple thousands of people there and there are no microphones. Therefore, you must repeat and tell the story and then swing around to make sure that the story that's being passed from first to first is the story you told. And it's an all day long affair. When Peter tells them, in the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. And he's not only there. He, he says it there. He says it twice. He mentions that women and men are prophesied by Joel to be involved in this kingdom work, publicly prophesying. We mentioned some of the prominent women last week, Phoebe, Junia, the daughters of Philip, Tabitha, and some more. But then we run up upon the rocks. 1 Corinthians 14, 34, Paul says that a woman cannot speak because that's the law. By the way, if you look in the Bible, there's no law to that effect. So that's just a little hint, by the way, what's coming up in the next sermons. What law is he talking about? And then 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2, once again, seems to be pretty strict. So what's going on here? What did, why is Paul throwing bars around women in these passages when the rest of the passages are, don't? Well, we don't allow two rocks to change the direction of the stream. We don't allow two rocks to sink the boat. When we navigate in rivers or shorelines, we pay attention to the rocks. You've got to know where the rocks are. But rocks are not the norm. Rocks are unusual. When you see a rock in the middle of the ocean, you pay attention. You go, there's a rock in the middle of the ocean. That would be what Scott McKnight would, would refer to as a, you know, having a, a blue bird. You know, a blue bird in the backyard is not normal. If you have a parrot all of a sudden show up in your backyard and you don't live in Australia or Africa or South America, you're going, maybe I should pay attention to this. What's going on here? It might be a blue parakeet. It might be something we need to pay attention to. We need to figure out when we see a rock, how not to run up on it and let it tear apart our ship of faith. How to navigate. How to, we don't ignore them. We put them on our charts. We put warning lights around them. We try to understand the edges. What parts of the river does the rock threaten or warn? Warn might be a better word. And then we keep, we keep sailing. You need to remember during all of this how revolutionary Jesus was. We don't get it because we live in 2024, unless you're watching this later. When Jesus included women, spoke to them, went in search of the Samaritan woman, he called a woman who was unclean his daughter. He allowed a sex worker to cry over his feet, to rub his feet dry with her hair. These were revolutionary acts that were shocking and completely, totally offensive to the religious and secular society in which he lived. And he didn't just do them in private. He did them in public and around the religious leaders, and around the secular leaders, and around the common people. Men just didn't do these things, and, and rabbis absolutely did not do these things, but it's an echo of Hosea. God tells Hosea, go woo that woman back. Change your attitude. Listen to Jesus. By the way, in our modern world, there are 49 nations in which what Jesus did with women is forbidden. You can be hanged or flogged by touching a woman who's not your relative, by walking with them, by referring to them in dear terms like daughter, dear woman, letting a sex worker touch you and forgiving her of all of her sins. This would get you, even today, would get you hanged or flogged. Jesus is a revolutionary. And we don't tend to get it because we usually use Jesus to trot out to, to do a feel-good story to really benefit and, and 
uh, underline, give a foundation to, and approve our way of life. That's not what he's here for. He's here to kick some doors open and knock over some trash cans and change some things. But the question still remains. If Jesus was so welcoming to women and honored them publicly, what's going on in these two passages by Paul? In the Timothy passage, Paul says, well, it has everything to do with Eve being made second. Well, we're going to talk about what he was talking about there. So hang on, but we're not going to do that today. This, this is, meat is something which, I've been to restaurants and I've seen people where they buy one of the big steaks and if you can eat it, it's free. Don't. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. Little bits is all you need, you know, to go through your life. Let's just do that now. Uh, I, don't, I don't get that. You know, gluttony to me is not an indoor sport. You know, it's not something that, that you should go for. We have to take meat a bite at a time. If you go too fast, you do choke. So we're going slowly. But is, it, is our women forbidden from speaking and teaching forever because they were made second and because she ate the fruit first? But there are several problems with that. By the way, um, John and Holly Knutson are with us now and full time, and we are so very excited. And John cuts up little bits of the sermon and puts them up on social media as reels. Well, people who have not heard any of the sermons will hear those 10 to 15 seconds and then hit me with a long treatise about blah, 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 and I'm going, you're jumping into the middle, you're making all these assumptions, what do I do? Sometimes we leave the comments up, sometimes they're harsh and mean, and so we pull them off. I'm allowed to. I've had people ask me, who would Jesus block? I said, read Revelation, get back to me. Um, we don't need to trouble the waters. But there's a couple problems. that when I, One guy said, Paul said it's because Eve sinned first. Here, yes. But in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, he said all sin came through Adam. Now, was Paul contradicting himself? Did Paul not know the scriptures? Paul was an expert in the scriptures. Paul knew exactly what he was doing. He was using scriptures the way the Jewish people have always used the scripture in which we're allowed to use them. And that is, let's apply them to this particular situation and adapt. For example, let's go back to Nehemiah. In Nehemiah, he really climbed all over them because they weren't keeping the Sabbath right because, and then he added things that are not in Exodus and not in Leviticus, not in the first five books. What was he doing? He was adapting the law for the current circumstances. They've always done that. Jesus did it too. When he said, you've heard it said, but I say, when Jesus worshiped in a synagogue, which is not mentioned in the Old Testament, but that's the way people were worshiping now, so he did. It's an adaptation. Paul was adapting it to the point. He says in Romans that, he was, uh, that Adam was the first sinner, so was Eve inferior because she sinned first? No. Adam's first sin was not eating the fruit. He had been given a charge by God to protect the garden, and he didn't. He allowed the serpent in, and he allowed the serpent to form a relationship with Eve. Adam sinned. There's about a year's worth of reading and teaching we could do about this one portion of Scripture. But for now, what we need to get from this is that early Christian men who were influenced by their culture, took this passage and ran with it, causing great harm to women believers, which we will unfold over the next two weeks. But we're going to give you a hint of it now, and it's not pretty. It is not pretty. You see, in the first 200 years of the church, in many places, to be fair, not all, but in many places, we saw women speaking, teaching, Engaging as equals, as shown in scripture, and in correspondence that still uh, survives from that time. When Constantine called the leaders of the church together, he called the men because Constantine didn't have women in his government. So he called the male leaders, and by that time, most of the leaders are, were male, to be honest. And they, he wanted to conform the churches, and they adapted or adopted 
the culture and ideas of the surrounding people. The church ceased then to be a transformational force in their society. They had been transformed by their society. They had allowed their society to change them. That is a constant danger. A constant danger. How bad did this get? Well, near the end of the second century, Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian, two leaders, uh, both who lived about the same time, about 150 to 210 AD, both wrote some really horrible, scathing things about women. Clement of Alexandria said women should blush that they were the same gender as Eve. Can you imagine Jesus saying that? Just read the Gospels. Can you imagine? Oh, it gets worse. Here you go, Tertullian. I'm going to look down because I want to read this exactly. He wrote one woman, Are you ignorant that you are an Eve? The sentence of God still lives upon your sex, even in this present age. And of necessity, the guilt lives on too. You are the devil's gateway. You are the unsealer of that tree. You are the first destroyer of divine law. You are she who persuaded him whom the devil was unwilling to attack directly. Okay. Where do you start? All right. First of all, you cannot imagine Jesus saying this ever, ever, ever. Second, the Bible is very, very clear that your guilt comes from your sins, not from somebody else's. Ezekiel says it very plainly, but then Jesus was asked, this guy's blind, who sinned, him or his parents? And Jesus said, neither. That's not the way this works. And he's never held us accountable for the sins of other people. We're going to talk more about these attitudes that came around the the end of the second century next week. But from now, let's mention just the curse. The curse that came on Adam and Eve when they disobeyed God. We're going to read it next week. But just think about the curse because people talk about that. Adam and Eve sinned, therefore we're all cursed. Let me ask a question. Did the coming of Jesus, his teaching, his death, and his blessed resurrection confirm a curse on us or did it break it? I think you know the answer to that question, even if Tertullian and Clement of Alexandria did not. Even if there was guilt on women because of Eve, what a horrendous thought. Jesus removed guilt. Have you read the first sermon in Acts 2? All the blessed blessings are on all the people. He came to set us free from the law of sin and death, Paul says. Why do we pick out two rocks and and define the entire ocean by them? All praise to Jesus who removed the curse and who saves us now and forever. Before we end this, just one more thought. In the transfiguration, one of the most astounding scriptures, uh, stories in scripture, Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus and and the apostles just freak out as you would, as you would. And they want to elevate Jesus and show him how powerful and high they think of Jesus by saying, "Let's, let's elevate you to the level of Moses and Elijah, our greatest heroes. Saying that was enough for God to do something stunning. He broke into nature, stopped it cracked open heaven, points at Jesus and goes, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. In a multivocal world where we are shouted at by politicians, gangs in the street, culture, music, no peace, screens follow us, no peace. There is one voice we, had, we listen to. The beloved son of God. When you are confused, sing out Psalm 88. 
pour out your complaints before the throne. Go for it. When you're happy, do Psalm 29. But always, when you go quiet, we listen to one voice. The voice of Jesus. Jesus.